Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to For the Love of Clark, a virtual exhibition. I'm Adam Thomas. I'm an assistant teaching professor of history here at CSU, and I'm also an alumnus of the graduate program in history uh, at CSU. So I've spent a considerable amount of my life uh, in the Clark building. Uh, please remember to keep yourselves on mute, uh, other than those graduate students who will be presenting. Uh, we will call for questions at the end of this presentation. We ask that you submit those questions uh, through um, Zoom's chat function. Tonight's event is also being recorded and will likely be available through the College of Liberal Arts social media, I assume on their uh, YouTube channel. Now, the words love and Clark usually aren't found next to each other. So before we get, begin, I want to launch a poll to see what you out there in Zoom land think about the Andrew G. Clark building. And you can be honest in this poll because I set it up to be anonymous, so no one will know. Uh, please keep in mind that depending on your platform or your device, you may not actually see the poll. Uh, so let me see if I can uh, launch it now. All right, so this exhibit is entitled For the Love of Clark, but do you personally love the Andrew G. Clark building? Give us an honest appraisal, please. All right, we're up to about 86% participation. See if we can kick it up to 90. Uh, very interesting so far. It appears that the uh, vast majority do have an opinion about Clark. So it's not as if we have we have many that people out there who don't have an opinion. Um, loving and hating it, definitely not the majority. Uh, most are in the like or indifferent category uh, and dislike. So right there in the middle, I think if I say end here, uh, you guys can actually um, see the results. Uh, so you should be able to see the results now. So I like Clark. It's almost 30% uh, of the vote there. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, there's still a strong dislike. I think if we take uh, hate and um, dislike together, it's still a pretty good, uh, pretty significant. Um, I uh, actually was walking through the A-Wing this evening and was really struck how beautiful the results were. Uh, how beautiful the, I'm sorry, how beautiful the sunlight was coming through the Brie Soleil into the A-Wing. So there can be times this building is quite uh, remarkable. So um, for me tonight, this is going to be an immersive experience as I'm actually sitting in my office in the Clark building. I realized that I first walked into this enormous befuddling building in the fall of 1999. And in some ways, it's just as mystifying now as it was 21 years ago. I still cannot figure out the best route from my office to the library or from my office to the Lori Student Center that I think a lot of you who have experienced this building know that it is one of the few places in the known universe where you can actually say, you just can't get there from here because it really happens in this building. But this building has always fascinate, fascinated me. My colleague, Dr. Sarah Payne and I have had many a long conversation concerning this building. And in the fall of 2019, we developed a much larger uh, historical research and storytelling project centered around the Andrew T. G. Clark building and recognizing the fact that its um, uh, day of restoration, its day of reckoning was coming very quickly um, for a much needed uh, massive renovation of this building. Um, while the pandemic quashed most of our plans, I decided to give my graduate students in History 540, the graduate seminar in material culture, a chance to research and analyze the material culture, the material world of the Clark Building and maybe unravel some of its mystery. Perhaps the findings of our 10 students tonight will change at least some of your minds about the building so many people love 
well, so many people love to hate. Um, so Sean, I believe you can take it away. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thomas, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, welcome to our virtual exhibition for the love of Clark. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is founded as a land grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly that our founding came at a dire cost to native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion that we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility and commitment. Slide please. We are the students from Dr. Thomas's History 540 Material Cultures Methods class. Our class is a mix of public historians and traditional thesis track historians, which lends this project a diverse set of methodologies. The Andrew G. Clark building is constructed in an eye or handbell shape with two large square buildings with paralleling bridges of offices and classrooms running north south between the two. The Northern building, Clark A, is the historic front of the building, while Clark C, the Southern building, was the first of the two open for classes. The B wing consists of the two parallel bridges running between the two, creating the distinctive courtyard beneath. Both Clark A and Clark C were designed with distinctive moats on their east and west sides. These moats were designed as green spaces extending outward from either side, allowing natural light into the lower floors and providing a long seat wall for gathering. Clark A has balconies that overlook these moats while Clark C does not. Construction took place in two phases, beginning with the B and C wings on July 1st, 1966, and the two open for classes in the fall of 1967. Phase two began construction on the A wing in October, 1967, and each of the two main buildings of, of Clark were designed to hold 2,500 students per hour, significantly increasing capacity, but only briefly. At the time of construction, this was the largest project ever undertaken by Colorado State University. The Andrew G. Clark building seen here in the center of the red circle, red square, holds a prominent position on campus as Clark A. North lies at the intersection of the campus pedestrian core and the University Avenue view corridor, one of the busiest foot traffic intersections on campus. The next slide shows Clark's position in the broader framework of campus, which we will linger on for just a moment. Thank you. Next slide, please. With renovation planned for the near future, is the intention of this project to capture a material culture analysis of the Andrew G. Clark building for posterity, as well as to inform our expectations regarding the future of Clark. Material culture examinations are a methodology meant to examine artifacts and to pull from them cultural meanings and values that inform our understanding of history. The Andrew G. Clark building is our artifact, and it is our intention to see how and why cultural attitudes around this building have tended towards animus within the student body and faculty. According to David Prown, cultural analysis is a means of overcoming the distortion of cultural biases to illuminate the underlying reasons why these attitudes persist in the first place. Finally, a brief note on language. When the structure was being planned and built, it was known as the Social Sciences Building. In 1977, the building was dedicated to Andrew G. Clark, a longtime CSU faculty member in the mathematics department. For the sake of clarity, we will refer to this structure, regardless of the time period, as the Clark Building, or simply as Clark. Thank you and enjoy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Natalie Stacker, and I'm going to start us off by talking about Clark's architectural style. If you visited or lived in the United States, you have no doubt seen a building in the same style as the Clark building. In some cases, they look like relics of the 1960s. They are sleek but blocky, traditional yet modern. You either love them or you hate them. 
This style is called new formalism. And if you have mixed feelings about it, so have millions of people since the 50s. New formalism came out of the 1950s, but really flowered in the 60s, which is when Clark was built. It was born out of a rejection of modernism by incorporating classical elements with a modern flair, such as columns, arches, and colonnades. Several other elements define new formalist buildings, like raised pedestals, breeze blocks, a formal landscape, and a white exterior. So what elements of Clark actually reflect this style? First, new formalism is defined by several classical features which Clark's B-wing bridges best reflect. The first comes from ancient Greece. This is an example of a colonnade or row of columns in Athens. And here is one of Clark's colonnades. Another classical feature that Clark exhibits is the coffering in the ceiling under the bridges, which kind of look like waffles. This characteristic is inspired by Roman architecture, which you can see here in the Pantheon in Rome. Next, Clark has several raised pedestals around the building, marking the entrances into the learning spaces. Many other new formalist buildings include this feature, especially in the West Coast. Clark also has something called a breeze soleil, which we'll talk more about later. This honeycomb feature can be seen in other buildings like Fullerton City Hall in California. Finally, as Sean mentioned earlier, Clark has a symmetrical eye layout which is best seen from above. If you have a favorite new formalist building, let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Now, why the new formalism for the Clark Building? Well, in the early 60s, the university asked James M. Hunter to, des to design the new social sciences building. In fact, Hunter designed 25 buildings on campus. Most of these buildings were designed in the new formalist style, including Morgan Library, the Lori Student Center, the Education Building, and Eddy Hall, which was called the Liberal Arts Building until 1978 when it was renamed. New formalism is generally used for buildings that foster a sense of community, like civic centers, auditoriums, and college campus buildings. The social sciences are diverse and highly interdisciplinary, which created a unique challenge for Hunter. He wanted to create a space where the departments could easily learn from each other and work together. The new formalist style was an ideal choice for this. Now, what does the style actually mean for Clark? Well, as I mentioned earlier, new formalism has provoked a variety of feelings over the decades. When it was first built, the social sciences building was new and exciting. It was a clean, white, bold, sleek, and functional as one source calls it, a machine for learning. <laughs> in the late 60s and early 70s, it would have been an imposing structure that took up nearly four acres, but it also complemented the other new formless buildings around it. Today though, many user users and visitors feel more, more negatively about it, but why is that? Well, perhaps it's because the surrounding buildings exteriors were updated over the years. In some cases, this was out of necessity as was the case with Eddie Hall in 97 because of a flood. Clark has gone through several renovations since the 1990s, but most changes have been to the interior, not the exterior, besides the notable color change, which we will discuss in more detail later. So it could come down to the fact that Clark simply isn't a good representation of the new formalist style anymore. It seems that Hunter had a vision for Clark that ended up functioning very differently in reality. I'll turn it over to my colleagues to help answer this question. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. My name is Daniel Gilbert and we're gonna get into the nitty gritty details and what better way to do that than by looking at the concrete and the sandstone. So as Natalie mentioned, Clark is a new formalist style building uh, and, it, and it was designed by James M. Hunter. Some of the major elements of Hunter's designs included a blending of natural elements with innovative concrete construction methods to produce massive and functional buildings which promoted feelings of warmth and engagement. Uh, 
Hunter had a few architectural ideals which were unique, including the use of locally sourced sandstone. In the case of the Clark Building, the red sandstone was sourced from the Lions Sandstone Quarry, and the buff is from the Masonville Quarry. On the left, you can see a map there. Uh, and as the crow flies, those quarries are about 27 miles from Fort Collins. Another standard or ideal of Hunter and new formalist architects in general is the restraint and discipline in color. In Hunter's case, he preferred color schemes matching that of natural growing things. James Hunter integrated sandstone ledge stones into nearly every building he designed, and he intended it as a way to play with the light across the jagged projections of stone as it projected inside the buildings. Many of Hunter's designs employed concrete construction methods, which were relatively innovative in the 1960s. Pre-stressed pre concrete utilized tendons placed into the concrete with tension applied as the concrete solidified. The use of precast slabs and sections allowed the, the initial phases, phases of construction to proceed relatively quickly. By using these innovative methods, Hunter's buildings were able to save around a dollar a square foot in construction costs, which when you're talking about a building the size of Clark is a considerable amount of money. The concrete and sandstone in the Clark building serves two purposes, both aesthetic and functional. Many of these elements will be discussed by my colleagues in more detail and from different angles. This slide shows some of the aesthetic elements, including the sandstone planters on the left, precast elements such as the waffle pattern coffering on the top center, and the classical Greek style and incised squares in the bottom center. There's also the breeze soleil on the right. There's the raised pedestal, which you can see on the far left. Um, that is an element of classical architecture, which places emphasis on the building and what it represents. In this case, the design implies the importance of the type of education which is housed in the Clark Building. The concrete also acts as a canvas for artwork and the sandstone itself serves as an aesthetic element of the building. Aside from aesthetics, concrete also serves as, a function, as functional elements. Obviously, it's the base of the building. Uh, concrete masonry units or concrete blocks comprise the structural core of the building. And it is also used as a method of controlling pedestrian flow. The roof, which is composed of concrete and built up rock, was designed to accommodate the future use of solar paneling on the central raised areas of Clark A and C. And finally, the precast benches around Clark were meant as a space for engagement and interaction between disciplines. However, they have mostly become transitional spaces to wait for the next class to start. Furthermore, the exterior benches were placed in a way that actually discouraged engagement with the environment around the Clark building, which my colleague Sean McCollum will discuss in greater detail in a bit. But first, let's get to color with Madeline. Hi everyone, I'm Madeline Powers. I'll be talking about the color and a little bit about the flooring of Clark. Clark's original colors followed the new formalist architectural style with the white exterior. It also had the natural sandstone with it. In 2006, the repainting of Clark began. These new colors are what we see peeling from Clark today, maroon and tan. While the original white evoked new formalist architecture, these colors attempt to blend Clark in with surrounding buildings. Clark attempts to complement other buildings modeled before and after it, such as the Morgan Library, Eddie Hall, and the Behavioral Sciences Building, to name a few. The tan and sandstone on Clark do this. For the interior, the first picture shows Clark's widely used white paint, tile, and white walls. This is one of the elevators in C Wing that we see, but we also see this floor on the floors and other parts of the building. Additionally, the middle and last photo shows the maroon staircases in C Wing, as well as staircases in Clark that are brown. We also have white ones. Next slide. Something that's interesting is a pop of color down in the basement. Almost any student you talk to claims that Clark is scary or haunted due to the dark basements and lighting at night. So this pop of color adds a little bit of something to the basements, makes it more welcoming to students. We see the orange and the blue and the green down in the A-wing basement. 
As soon as you walk into Clark A Wing, you see this brown tile. It complements the sandstone and adds much to the Clark A Wing since it's original and it paves the way to all the lecture halls inside of Clark A Wing on that floor. There's tan B and C wing tiles as well. We have original tan tile in the history department's lobby. Additionally, there's tan tile that spreads along the Clark C wings first floor that leads to some of the classrooms. As you can see, there's many different types of styles of carpet inside of Clark. Some of the carpets do complement the building. Other carpets make it feel like that dark, dreary place that students sometimes feel like um, it's haunted. So it's interesting to see different types of carpeting and different types of lighting and colors. One more thing that I wanted to mention was the exterior tile. As you see, this is A-wing. There's also some exterior tile on the pedestals in C-wing. These are original tiles that adds a lot to the building because this aesthetic element on the pedestals follows the original tile entering into A-wing and at the very beginning of the entrance into C-wing. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Hello again. So my name is Sean McCollum and I'm gonna take you back outside while we explore the planted environment of the Andrew G. Clark building. Beginning with the historic front at Clark A North, we see that the original sign, which has been there, the name has changed, but the original sign has been there since construction and is flanked by two radiant crab apple trees. These trees were propagated by a CSU horticulture graduate student and were planted here because their spring blooms brighten up the intersection and they have a high tolerance for shade, which is important on the north side of the building. Moving east, the moat along Clark A East is worth examining briefly as it is the only one of four moats uh, that have been irrigated. As a result, the moat is entirely covered with verdure and has three American linden trees providing shade. The screen space is filled with native pollinators and also no longer requires maintenance. I think this is important to pause here and realize that the diverse drought and shade tolerant varieties of plant life here have only been irrigated since 2002. Imagine how the other three moats could look if irrigating them as part of the future renovation plans. Clark A has one other distinctive feature that serves a sustainability purpose as well as a palliative one. On the Northwest corner of Clark A lies the pollinator garden which is just one part of a broader effort to make the campus more sustainable and bee-friendly. These efforts led to CSU earning a bee-friendly campus certification in 2018, one of only 105 campuses in the nation to do so. The courtyard beneath the Clark B bridges is meant to be a gathering space for students, but lacks much of the experiential design that would facilitate such. In this image, we can see a blank slate from 1967, ready to be filled with a planted environment, but no clear picture of what that environment might look like existed at the time. Here we see the patio on the north side of the Clark B courtyard. So far underutilized in my time at CSU, this has been a well-loved gathering space in the past, but now remains mostly empty. Standing water has cracked many of the tiles and allowed for beautiful moss to spread between the tiles that are broken where sunlight is minimal. Here's an image of that same patio from 1983. Students, faculty, and family are gathered here for a summer performance by CSU's Cafe Theater. This is a striking image that demonstrates how these spaces have been used in the past. The popularity of these events is demonstrated by the extant Cafe Theater poster on the right of the slide by then CSU student John Sorby, which advertises the 1978 season, courtesy of the Denver Museum of Art. The Southern Courtyard features a single tree, which is a spring snow crab apple tree in a mulched bed and flanked with angled benches beneath. The spring snow crab apple is beautiful, vibrant, and fragrant in the spring. The benches beneath are not a part of the original design, but they are the most frequently used. Clark C 
similarly features four sides and two moats on its east and west sides, but lacks the balconies of Clark A. However, Clark C has the distinct advantage of lying along the Montfort quadrangle to the east and the liberal arts quad across the pedestrian court to the southwest. Clark C South, again, is worth examining as it is the most diverse corridor of the Clark Building and the only irrigated corridor of Clark C. Featuring the winding ADA ramp, this section is shaded by three large gamble oaks, which can be seen in detail on the left. The green space also features a growing stand of Schubert choke cherries, sumac bushes, and a ground covering of savin juniper. All these plants are native, all are water restrictive, and all are doing very well in the newly enforced shade thrown by the Behavioral Sciences Building. Again, this section was irrigated and planted during renovation efforts to incorporate the ramp into the building. This too could be a portent of a shadier Clark building to come. The environment surrounding the Andrew G. Clark building is constantly evolving, meaning that no two generation of students are going to experience the same planted environment. The architecture and design of the Andrew G. Clark building was primary, while the planted environment was a distant second in terms of importance, and that remains to be reckoned with. While the overall construction is notably symmetrical, the built environment of the courtyard planters, the pollinator garden, and the imbalance between the planted environment of the four moats give the building a contrasting asymmetric feel on the outside. This could be remedied by including plants to irrigate the moats, uh, including plans to irrigate the moats, and to plant more diverse native climate tolerant plants. The shape of Clark to come remains unknown, but my research has shown that regardless of the form the structure takes, the university is going to make efforts to ensure that the surrounding planted environment remains in line with the rest of the campus. Colorado State remains committed to the environment on campus and efforts have been made to introduce diverse native and drought resistant plant life. Sustainability drives the planted environment and will continue to do so as Clark enters the next phase of its life on campus. With that in mind, I feel a responsibility to mention that the green ash trees running along the east and west side of Clark have been there since the building was completed and are some of the only remaining environment that generation of students do share. With renovations scheduled, it is imperative that efforts are made to protect these ash trees. Currently, these trees are being treated by CSU facilities against a different threat, the emerald ash borer beetle, so it would be irresponsible if they were to incur damage because of construction. The seriousness of the ash borer threat is such that these trees could not be replaced, and that would be a devastating blow to one of the only symmetrical parts of Clark's planted environment. Thanks very much. If you have questions about the environment or trees specifically, please let me know in the chat and I will be happy to answer them. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the program. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Rose and I'll be discussing the Brie Soleil architectural feature. And uh, first, a little bit of an overview. The Brie Soleil feature is typically credited to Edward Durrell Stone, who achieved architectural stardom uh, because of a number of prominent projects that he completed, including the Museum of Modern Art between 1935 and 39, and the Gallery of Modern Art between 1956 and 64. Both of those are in New York City. He also completed the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, India in 1954, and achieved the cover of Time Magazine in uh, March of 1958. The um, phrase Brie Soleil is French for sun blocker and uh, it typically appears as a perforated screen. Uh, as Danny indicated earlier on the Clark building it is made of concrete and uh, considering James Hunter's interest in solar technology uh, this feature makes sense as applied on the Clark building. And uh, here we'll see a diagram of the uh, features functionality. So what happens is that the Brie Soleil reflects the sun's glare away from the building. So this reduces the temperature inside of the building. And here we'll be able to compare the rough appearance of the Clark building on the top image uh, prior to the Brie Soleil being installed. Um, and then on the bottom, you see the installation having been completed. Uh, the Brie Soleil feature covers the windows on the A and C wings of the Clark building, and uh, this comparison shows the distinctiveness of this architectural feature. And uh, next, as a part of this exhibit, I uh, completed an informal survey of the campus community. 
um, you all can feel free to uh, include in the uh, in the chat your answers to the, these questions as well. Um, first, there's a number of names that have uh, developed to describe this feature, and uh, Honeycomb seems to have taken the lead. Uh, Brie Soleil actually was uh, was second up uh, as names that people have heard used uh, to describe the feature. And uh, next, we'll talk about some symbolism of this feature. It is a, the Brie Soleil is a mainstream modern departure from the international style of architecture. And um, it's a character defining feature of new formalism, as uh, Natalie explained earlier. This uh, feature on the Clark Building also creates an intimate interior space. When viewed, when view, people are viewing the Clark Building from the outside, it makes it the Brie Soleil sort of obstructs the view. It makes it opaque. So people on the inside uh, experience a more intimate setting. And uh, lastly, I asked if people like or dislike the building uh, as we had the poll uh, earlier on. Um, you know, a lot of people seem not to like the building. In fact, about a little over half of the, uh, the respondents to my poll uh, do not like the building. So uh, that was interesting to see, but it is close. It is uh, right at about half and half here. And uh, perhaps some of the dislike of the building is a recent lack of usage of the community space. As Sean indicated, this uh, image on the top left is a cafe theater uh, in 1983 uh, with the Soleil feature as the backdrop. Uh, I think this looks really cool. And uh, the Clark building was designed with the community uh, usage as a, a main feature of the building. And uh, we found that the last outdoor theater took place in 2000. So we hope that um, post COVID-19, uh, this type of usage will, uh, will return. And uh, I think that's all I have and I'll hand it over to Michael. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Webster and I'll be speaking about the windows, doors and interior wood paneling of Clark. So the first thing I want to touch on are the two most predominant style of window within Clark. There are the aluminum framed windows with the casement, uh, which are visible in the photo on the left. And there are the aluminum framed floor to ceiling windows that are very common in the A-wing of Clark uh, on the right. So first, looking at the casement windows, these are most common in Clark's faculty offices of the B and C wings. Um, it's also important to realize that they're implemented in long bands. This is due to the modernist influence that helps uh, illustrate that new formalist style. And furthermore, due to having the ability to open and close, these windows allow for those who occupy them uh, to have a moderate say over their immediate climate and uh, potentially gain some access to those ambient sounds of campus uh, when there's not a pandemic. The final to note of these windows is uh, one of the interesting ways that they've been utilized as a method of self-expression. Uh, I think that you accidentally went one too many there. Oh, oh, nice. There we go. All right, sorry if my internet was cutting out. Uh, so the final point for these windows is how they've been utilized as a method of self-expression by faculty members who have opted to decorate these windows in a way that student passerbys can view. Uh, personally, I think that there's a good reason for this, and it's that Clark is in the middle of campus, and the building is very eye-catching uh, to a wide variety of pedestrians. So surely somebody will see whatever statement you make, whether that be a poster, sign, flag, or whatever else in your window. And uh, now I'd just like to throw a quick question out for anyone who maybe answer in the chat. If, uh, if you have an office or a, a door in Clark, that you've ever decorated or advertised with, uh, I'd like to hear about it. So feel free to share that. So the next batch of windows that I wanna take a look at are those aluminum framed floor to ceiling windows of the A-Wing. Uh, as we heard before with Sean, there's that iconic Brie Soleil with its climate control functionality. Uh, but underneath that, element are the windows key to providing a majority of the natural lighting to the open spaces of A-Wing. So while the breeze delay shields the second and third levels, these windows are still very important. So 
Something else that's uh, important to this interior space uh, can be found with the interior wood paneling. Uh, the spaces of a wing retain the greatest amount of historical integrity. Also for many, it's the most appealing section of Clark. I would assert that this is due in part to the warmth provided both by the natural light, uh, lighting and the accents that the wood paneling placed throughout this area provide. I'd say that this difference is especially noticeable when you compare the A-wing to the confusing, dark, cold, and allegedly haunted spaces of C-wing. So now shifting to the doors, I'd like to talk a little bit about the entryways of Clark. Each entrance uh, has a set of aluminum frame double doors, uh, each with large rectangular transom windows. These doors were made by uh, the Conier Company, uh, who are a pioneer in the glass and metal entryway manufacturing. Uh, actually, their founder, Francis John Flim, changed the face of the world literally when he invented the resilient metal framing that made large window expanses possible for buildings all the way back in 1906. Uh, the product is named after the Kansas River, or the Kaw, which ran near the Kansas City-based sheet metal shop where this project was first manufactured. And only about 40 years later, by the end of World War II, Conier was well on its way to becoming a world leader in aluminum-based construction. So the current Conier entrances of Clark are dated to 1984. However, they were markedly different uh, from the originals. So the replacement doors have a pronounced aluminum middle panel, while the original doors, as you can see on the left, uh, pr provide a greater continuity with the surrounding windows with their more concise surrounds. And uh, this is just another one of those examples of the little details of Clark being changed over time. So the last thing I'd like to talk about real quick are the interior doors of Clark. Because there's such a wide variety of doors within the building, each with their unique materials and components, for the sake of this presentation, I just want to focus on the fire doors that bookend the B-Wing. So in 1965, the Warhauser Company opened a particle board operation in Marshfield, Wisconsin, where these doors were produced. And uh, here they were able to start building upon a patent that they had fired, uh, that they filed one year later in 1966. This patent uh, aimed to produce a fire door that could resist high temperature fires for up to 90 minutes using a mineral core. And uh, at the time of Clark's construction, they were at the cutting edge of public safety, but since then employee lawsuits against the company have claimed that between the 1950s up until 1978, uh, at least some of these doors contained asbestos which is just uh, another testament to the uh, changing building standards since Clark was established. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, we'll go ahead and go to Flo. Hi, my name is Ollie Bode and let's talk about the flow or lack thereof of Clark. So as you can see on this diagram of Clark, <laughs> there are a bunch of entrances which I have marked with a red triangle. Those are all of the entrances to Clark. There are around nine. Um, a wing has about three or four. The B wing has two separate staircases and C wing has four. So there are a bunch of different ways to get into Clark. And I know that I take the same route every day because I know that way I won't get lost. <laughs> um, but I know that everyone, if you go out a different entrance, you're just gonna find yourself in a completely new place on campus and you're gonna be like, where am I? And it's like a maze due to its many staircases and the fact that there are three floors in the A wing, including the basement, and there are four floors in the C wing, including the basement. And the, um, the separate breezeways of B are only two floors. So, Clark, it's so confusing. And people have come up with so many ideas about why Clark is so confusing. And the most, the one that people have most focused on, um, they think it's purposefully maze-like to deter protesters and riots. 
of the 1960s and 70s. And the in 1970, there was the burning of a building on campus called Old Main, and it was the heart of campus. And it was said to be burnt down by protesters. However, we don't really know if that's true or not. Um, and so, so many people think that because of the confusion of Clark, they made it so that students couldn't gather in large numbers. And there are so many fire doors that you're not supposed to prop open, but people do anyway, so that if it did get set on fire, that they would be able to put it out quicker and it wouldn't burn to the ground like Old Main. However, now that we know that Clark was built in 1967 through 68, and the burning of Old Main was in 1970, it seems like that myth is really just a myth. It's not true. <laughs> However, we understand Clark is just so strange, so confusing. And there are so many staircases. On the previous map, I marked uh, <laughs> all the staircases with red circles, but there are about 10, staircases or 12 staircases in Clark. There are four in A, four in C, and four in B wing, two connecting B and C wing, and they even have their own staircase that <laughs> connects the lower floor of B wing to the upper floor of B wing. Um, and staircases, seem to open on and lead up on the right and both the left. There's no continuity with the staircases. And honestly, it reminds me of an MC Escher painting. Um, and it's also because of the weird floor difference between Clark A and Clark C, that they have these weird little half staircases connecting Clark B to Clark C, Clark A, my, my mistake. <laughs> And this, the reason that there are so many weird staircases is because of James Hunter's idea that people should be able to go anywhere in the building. However, that only really works for able-bodied people. Um, and people didn't really start thinking about disability and accessibility within buildings until the 1960s civil rights movement started. Um, and the first idea about um, accessibility was 1961, the American National Standards Institute. They came up with a guide of accessible and usable buildings and facilities. However, this was just for private buildings. And it wasn't until 1968 that the Architectural Barriers Act was passed by Lyndon B. Johnson requiring greater accessibility in public funded buildings. But Clark was already built in 1968 by the time this was passed. So it wasn't really until later with the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act that people really started taking accessibility seriously. As we can see in this <laughs> photograph, we can see that they tried to adapt some ADA policies into Clark. And this is in the A wing behind all the classrooms, they converge into this room that's supposed to be the accessibility corridor for students, at least until they had created other accessibility options in the building. However, now it is just full of stuff. Um, and also some of the doors are very narrow and the ramps are not, uh, they're too steep. So accessibility has really been a problem in Clark. And honestly, um, we can see that the accessibility was really an afterthought in Clark. As you can see in the picture on your far right, I think the ramp was put over the stairs. <laughs> um, and so now that's causing issues because it's starting to crumble and weaken over the stairs. Also the ramps are too steep. Um, and as you can see in the next picture over, the there's the elevator at the back of that room However, you can see that this clearly was meant to be an office and they had to demolish that and make an open wide, an open space um, to put in an elevator. However, it looks from the outside, it looks like it should just be an office. So it's very confusing to find. Um, and also restroom accessibility is um, limited because of weird stair issues. And so in the A wing, there's only accessible restrooms on the first floor. 
So we still have some work to do with accessibility in the Clark building. Thank you for your time. Hi everyone, I am Nolan Dom and I'm gonna be discussing the furniture in the Clark building. Um, furniture is kind of funny to study, uh, especially as it relates to architecture because it changes so much based on budgets and the whims of random people who just wanna move an extra chair and even vandalism, as you can see in this picture from just a few months after Clark opened when the bench carpets were replaced because so many students were putting out their cigarettes directly on the bench. So this idea of shifting furniture and updating through furniture is even more relevant in Clark and in academic buildings where um, so many different disciplines have used this space for different activities over the year. So to avoid having to talk about all the different furniture that's ever been in Clark, I chose to focus on the things that make Clark Clark. So the things that anyone in the last 50 years might have seen if they entered this building. So first is the lecture halls in the A-Wing. And these photos are from right after Clark opened and they look almost identical to the way the lecture halls are set up today. And actually for the longest time, I thought that they hadn't been updated really at, really at all. However, a conversation I had with Dr. Alexander today, um, uh, she told me that these original desks that you see here were replaced at some point in the 1980s. Um, and then the auditorium, um, and they were replaced with that auditorium seating with those annoying tiny little hinge desk, uh, hinge desks that nothing fits on. And that was actually the furniture of choice in these lecture halls until about 10 years ago when they were replaced um, during a large remodeling of the interior of Clark. Um, so this space is really what Clark is known for. Um, this is where most students who take introductory classes take their classes. And there's countless pictures of things going on here throughout history um, in the CSU Collegian, for example. For example. Now, the second key part of Clark's furniture are the built-in benches. And this is a key idea in Clark's architecture and in the new formalist style in general. Um, there's still plenty of open spaces and hallways and a clear flow in those hallways in general in the Clark building. But the, at the same time, there's plenty of seating um, on these benches. And the idea is that it reflects an idea of collegiality, that you might walk through the space and hear people having conversations about all sorts of different subjects. Um, and now students do everything on these benches from studying to chatting to napping and mostly just waiting around for their next class. So one of the most controversial and maybe underutilized parts of Clark's uh, furniture is the outdoor seating. And you can see the extension of the interior bench idea that there's plenty of places to sit outside. There's a courtyard and balconies. And again, a very common thing in new formalism. Um, however, in new formalism, usually there's sculptures and art and plants and plenty of life in these spaces. And in Clark, um, we've seen that that's sometimes a little bit lacking. So on the left, you see Cafe Theater, which was Clark's courtyard at its busiest. Um, and then on that top left, you see a current picture of the Clark Courtyard, which is a drab space. There's a line of benches facing away from the landscaping. Um, and Fred Haberick, CSU's lead landscape architect, um, really is critical of these benches, saying that people don't sit like pigeons on a wire and that it's non-experiential design. Um, on the right, you see students having a class on the balcony. Um, granted, it was because the um, air conditioning in Clark was out at the time, but I think this demonstrates a great use of the balcony space um, that aren't used really anymore. Um, and again, the CSU's lead architect argues that's because they were designed for students to go out and have a cigarette and they don't do that anymore. But I think that he would agree that those balconies are still useful for so much more than just a quick smoke break. So another criticism of the Clark building is that it's been plagued by overcrowding since the beginning. Um, but I think that this is more, this is a bigger problem than just with the Clark building, because at this time, the CSU student body had just doubled to 15,000 people in the year that Clark opened, and there was never going to be enough classrooms to fulfill the need. Um, here we see an environmental club meeting in the A-Wing where students are filling up all the seats, spilling over onto the floor. Um, and of course, classes were probably not this packed, but the article really reflects student concerns about the lack of space for lectures due to too many seminar rooms and lab spaces and not enough room for big gatherings like this. 
Um, and CSU is still trying to kind of struggling to figure out how to accommodate all of its students and still ensure that it remains accessible to all different types of learners. So just to wrap up my discussion of furniture, I think that furniture has so much potential for quickly changing how a space gets used. Um, for example, what happens if we bring back cafe theater or what happens if we put comfortable reading chairs on these underused patios that overlook the moats with native plants? Um, what happens if we get rid of this bulky furniture on the right in a wing so that there is finally a clear main entrance to the building? Um, there's so much potential with furniture to easily signal to students how they can and should interact with the space. And right now, I think that Clark is quite underutilized in that regard, um, but it does have potential, which is demonstrated from some of the ways that students have interacted with the building in the past. Thank you. Hello, I'm Margaret and I'm going to be talking about the lighting, both the artificial lighting and the natural lighting of Clark. So starting with the outdoor lighting. So these photos are what you usually see at night when you think of Clark and when you see it. Um, but they're not exactly what Clark would have looked like back when it was first built or even in the 70s. So uh, what I like to call the waffle lights, they're really the coffering lights. They're original and they are still used, but the in-ground lights, which are which is just the single light that you can see uh, on the middle photo, uh, they are not used anymore. And this would have lit up the building all around it in a very cool way. And if you look, and in the black and white photo, if you look closely, you can see a sconce. These are not, those are the original sconces. The sconces that Clark has now are not original. But remember the sconces because they're gonna be really important in a few slides. So then the question is, what did Clark used to look like? It used to look like something like this when it was lit up. Uh, the lights highlighted details that were lost in the daytime, such as with, with highlighting the waffle, the colonnades and the breeze soleil used to be absolutely gorgeously brilliantly lit up. So now the indoor lighting and as my colleagues know, I love these chandeliers. These chandeliers are my favorite and the coolest things ever. I just love them. Um, so they're probably inspired by the Italian designer Steel Lari and James M. Hunter probably just ordered them out of catalog. So if they look familiar, they should look familiar because those sconces that you saw, the original ones, are many versions of those chandeliers, which means that these chandeliers and those sconces, at least the globe light with the ironwork, was probably a pretty particular design motif throughout the building designed to give it some continuity. Um, so what do these chandeliers and sconces do for the building? They provide warmth and coziness, especially because this is about blending modern and classical together. So now natural lighting. As you can see in these older photos, um, the first one is about when Clark was first opened. Clark was meant to receive a lot, a lot, a lot of natural light, even with the trees around it. Um, sadly, that is not the case anymore because most of these trees have grown up and more buildings have come onto campus that are blocking more of Clark's sunlight they used to have. So unfortunately, one entire wing does not receive the amount of light that it used to get. So that is my part on lighting and I will now pass it to Taylor to talk about art. Hey. Hello all, my name is Taylor LaPointe and I'm gonna to talk to you about art and the Clark building. New, the emergence of new formalism actually occurs around the same time that private and public institutions begin to embrace the incorporation of art in their uh, construction plans. Uh, this here is an image of the LA Music Center with a grand sculpture and fountain on the exterior, which were incorporated into the original plans of the building. The Clark Building did not have any of the same sort of public art built into its original construction plans, which is actually pretty odd considering the style at the time. Um, art is prevalent throughout the campus, but the main sculpture outside of the building and two of the murals installed uh, in the building itself were only installed in the last decade. 
So the first piece of art that I'm going to be talking about is the Andrew G. Clark portrait. Um, Andrew Clark, of course, was a mathematics professor and later the dean of faculty. Um, the portrait was commissioned by the university in 1977 uh, when the building was dedicated. It's a fairly traditional academic portrait, oil on canvas, painted from a photographic portrait captured of Clark around the same time. The portrait itself is located on the south side of the A-wing, sitting about up about eight feet high, which allows Andrew Clark to oversee one of the main lounge areas in the building. The main sculpture, the only sculpture on the exterior of the building is located on the northwest side of the Sea Wing. Um, this multimedia sculpture was designed and created by the CSU architect Per Hagestad um, in around 2011-2012. It was commissioned by the former Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Dr. Ann Gill, with the intention of showing a lively representation of campus life in a planter that is unable to hold plants due to drainage issues. Mountain biking is a popular recreational activity for CSU students, and CSU students actually use the planters in Clark's courtyard frequently as places to do tricks on their mountain bikes. Um, the colors in the splatter motif reflect the vibrancy of the sport, but the sculpture, despite its bright colors, largely goes unnoticed by students. It's perhaps most famous actually for being a Pokemon Go gem, uh, courtesy of the popular mobile app. Uh, the sculpture is actually not included in any of the public records on campus, and there's no plaque near it indicating uh, a title, an installation year, artist name, or reason for its presence. The second piece of art we're looking at is the Remembrances Memorial, uh, the mural in the history department um, located on the third floor of the B-Wing. Um, the mural was commissioned in 1983 by the History Honor Society Phi Alpha Theta to spark discussion and make the long history department hallway more appealing. The mural features 11 groups of his important historical figures laid out chronologically left to right and grouped seemingly according to era, though there is no label indicating the reasoning for the, groupies, for the groupings or who some of the less recognizable figures are. When the mural was commissioned, history faculty were asked to name the most influential people in history, a condition that was itself controversial, as influential does not necessarily connotate a positive thing. A secular institution, for example, can't really include portraits of Muhammad, Jesus, Buddha, uh, despite their overwhelming influence um, on history. The mural actually corresponds with the original design for the Clark Building, which was to naturally come across discussion and debate. The mural itself hasn't really aged well and reflects a period of great man history that was popular in the 1980s, but which has since sort of fallen out of style. There are only two women located on the mural, one of whom, Eleanor Roosevelt, is located along her, uh, alongside her husband, while the other, which I think might be uh, Marie Curie, is confined to the same cluster as Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, and Malcolm X, seemingly representing the marginalization of women and people of color in the greater timeline of history. The style that the portraiture, um, the, the portraits themselves are inspired by is actually M.C. Escher, which is kind of funny considering um, how Ollie noted that it reminded them of the staircases in the building. The other two murals in the C-Wing um, are the Journalism and Media Communication mural and the College of Liberal Arts mural located on the second and first floors of the C-Wing respectively. Um, these murals both reflect motifs of the university with silhouettes of the Rocky Mountains painted in the university colors. Um, the CLA mural is another work of art that was commissioned around 2011 by doc former uh, Dean Dr. Ann Gill. So all this kind of begs the question, is Clark art? The employment of the new formalism style and such ornaments as the Breeze Soleil indicate that Clark is not just a utilitarian building and is meant to have an aesthetic element to it. However, people's aesthetic experience is often tainted by the negative experience in his labyrinthine interior. The building's informal designation as CSU's junk drawer and its neglected status also tends to spoil one's view of any sort of pleasant aestheticism. So this brings us to the question of, so what? Why does any of this matter? Well, there is a lot of interest in the Clark Building. I mean, we have convinced all of you to sit in a Zoom meeting for roughly an hour talking about the Clark Building. So there's a lot of opportunities to reinterpret the built environment of CSU's campus through the Clark Building. 
Uh, in 2017, a survey found that 70% of stu students took at least one class in the Clark Building. Um, while that's not the case this semester, it hope hopefully soon we will return to those times. Um, in 1972, the social sciences had one of the largest budgets of the various departments at CSU. Uh, liberal arts still has one of the largest budgets, and it is one of the biggest groups of majors at CSU today. An emphasis on maintenance could go a long way, and small changes could result in a reinterpretation of spaces and a realignment with initial goals and ideals would likely improve the CSU community's perception of the Clark Building and Liberal Arts Department as a whole. So then we also came up with some other improvements that we could that could potentially be made to Clark either in the short term or even potentially the long term. Um, these are add a gender neutral bathroom, make improvements for accessibility, use the original lighting around the building, change the color scheme away from maroon, add more study spaces and reinterpret the space, take care to protect the green ash trees around Clark during the renovation, continued effort to plant native drought resistant plants, utilize the roof space for garden or solar panels due to the amount of light it gets, and retain the breeze to lay. Those are just some improvements. So then we decided to think, well, what do we like about Clark? You know, besides the obvious that we go here and it's a building and it's very interesting. So Nolan says that it's a unique space with a ton of potential. I say that the chandeliers are beautiful and super cool. Taylor says that the design provides a nice space for public art and exhibition. Sean says that he loves Clark because no two generations of students have experienced the same planted environment. Natalie says it has a rich history and that's what we're all about. Madeline says you will always remember your experience in the building, whether you love it or hate it. Danny said that there's potential for reinterpretation and Sean Rose said the Breeze Soleil is really unique and really cool. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you for coming to it. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know your questions and comments in the chat. Um, and I believe Dr. Thomas has another poll, which is, has your opinion of Clark changed? Um, you can answer in the chat. And so now, hopefully, to your questions. So Dr. Thomas, I think it is time uh, for you to do question moderation. All right. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Uh, wow, that's fantastic. Um, you may have noticed in there a little trend with those of us who study material culture, and that is, Whenever you actually sit down and have to study some little thing that you haven't been interested in before, suddenly you become very passionate about that thing. Um, who knew that there would be so much interest in a concrete breeze soleil? Um, or there could be so much interest in a chandelier in the lobby, right? But when you get into these topics, uh, when you really start thinking about the elements that provide the experience of Clark and the history behind those elements, um, it really creates a fascinating moment. So yes, I do have a poll. Maybe this poll will end up being exactly the same um, as before, uh, but let's see. I'm gonna launch it again, see if we have had any changes here um, in our perceptions of Clark uh, as we looked at it. Um, I'll add my little bit in here too. I think one of the takeaways I've gotten from these student projects is that Part of the problem with Clark, and this often is true for a lot of modern architecture, is that it hasn't been treated well over the years. It doesn't represent the vision that was originally there. You know, things like the sconces disappearing, the light changing, the breeze soleil has been covered over the years with all manner of netting to keep pigeons out of it, right? And those sort of things, what we see now isn't a vision that James Hunter had. It's not the model of that clean modernity that really would have been stunning to students when they first arrived here uh, in 1968. All right, it looks like we have about 84% of respondents in. I'll give it another few seconds here to see if we get uh, any more in. And um, actually, I am really surprised. Um, I'm gonna end the poll, share it with you. Um, guys, you did a great job. Um, there is a sizable group now in the I love and I like Clark uh, categories. Um, maybe this 
is uh, evidence that a little bit of uh, historical context and appreciation for the built environment can change opinions. Um, all right, so I'm going to look at um, the uh, the um, sorry, I'm going to look at the uh, chat here. Uh, to see if anything, hey, if you guys haven't looked at the chat, there's absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, Dr. Little pointed out that the figure with uh, Gandhi and Dr. King is in fact Margaret Sanger. Is that right, Dr. Little? That's um, interesting. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Dean Withers had a very interesting question about why is there a perception that the Clark building is haunted and who is haunting it? I think there are a few students who are still lost in this building who are trying to get to my history 151. Um, I don't know where else they would be. Um, so maybe they're the ones who are haunting it. Um, there's a lot of uh, impressions that people have put in here through the years. Dr. Everett has uh, put in a fabulous image of the building. Um, and has really thought about the, you know, has really um, shown his appreciation for it. Um, I know he's a big fan of Edward Durrell Stone. Um, let's see here. Um, <laughs> my wife, Sherry Yost, uh, said that I should have assigned someone to cover the HVAC system. Um, I think that's probably true. I think it's funny. Um, I don't know who it was that had the picture of the students outside because the air conditioner failed. Apparently the air conditioner always fails in Clark. I guess that's always been part of it. Um, let's see. Uh, Dr. Little brings up the point about maintenance is always a big deal with buildings at the critical 40, critical age 40, 50 years old. Um, she asks um, uh, myself and the students, what about the unpainting, what about unpainting the building to restore the white new formalist aesthetic? Um, so we'll start with that part first. Any opinions among the uh, graduate students? I think the general consensus is that we would love to see it repainted back to white and away from the maroon. I think that's the general consensus of all of us. Um, there might be a couple of us that disagree, but I'm not entirely sure on that. I think the purpose of the colors right now is to complement the other buildings around campus and the area that it's surrounded by. Um, but I understand why they painted it that maroon and tan to match that sandstone. I, do like the white from the original pictures, but I just don't think that it's modern enough for campus today. I would say that the, the environment surrounding, <clears throat> the environment outside of Clark, if there's bad attitudes towards Clark, it's not coming from the planted environment, it's coming from the peeling paint and the cracks in the concrete and the thousands of remnant pieces of tape from, from generations of posters. I think that going back to white would make that space feel more clean. It would make that space feel a little bit more uh, open and in, easier to engage with. I think that question also begs another question and that is why has the exterior of Clark been largely, one might say neglected or apparently so? All right, any other questions or thoughts about the sort of the painting issue? I actually, I remember the first time I saw this building repainted. Um, I came here, I believe, to talk at a class, um, it, talk to Dr. Orsi's class um, long after I had graduated. And I literally had to pick my jaw off the ground because I was so shocked it had been painted. And I was not a big fan from the beginning, but that's because I study architectural history and I knew that this was a uh, new formalist building and new formalist buildings are white. Um, so it was pretty shocking to see that. But the fact is, and uh, I actually talked about this in my architectural history class today, there's two levels of new formalist buildings. There are new formalist buildings that are constructed of yo marble, buff granite, like the white comes from gorgeous stone. And there's another level of new formalism where it's concrete that's painted white. And that's the situation we have here. Um, and the fact is that paint will always need to be kept up to date. In fact, it's probably not a great treatment long-term for a building of this age as Dr. Little uh, pointed out. 
Um, let's see, I'm looking for uh, some other comments here. Dr. Little also added that she thinks that Sanger is a perfectly appropriate person to put with King um, and Gandhi since he was such a key figure in women's liberation in the 20th century. Yeah, um, I agree. Uh, very interesting insights. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, Dr. Everett asks, what do the students think about the proposal to expand the building either vertically or horizontally as part of the proposed renovations? And I think, and those of you who are more familiar with the proposed renovations, I think they're very much just in the visioning stage at this point. Um, but the last proposal I saw, or the last um, presentation of the plan I saw, basically it was to demolish the um, the B wing and then sort of greatly expand the A and C wings of Clark as two separate buildings. So what do you students who've studied this building, what do you think about that? I think in class, we talked about how we feel that B wing is actually the most successful part of Clark itself. Um, because I don't, we can't even say how many times we've walked down the halls of Clark pre-COVID and we've heard someone having a conversation in an office or in a different room and it's made us like think about something or we're just like, oh, hey, I should pop by this professor's office and talk to them and meet them. And it really facilitates learning. Um, whereas I think we all kind of agreed that C is kind of dark and haunted and <laughs> we'd, we'd be more able to let C go rather than B. I am going to second what Ollie just said. Um, yeah, B is the most successful part of the building and it seems like that is the part that they are most keen to um, dismantle in preference of kind of either raising up A and C or expanding them out. Um, yeah. It, it's just a great place of engagement, which is what the building was designed for. And I also concur that you could completely tear down C. That place is a dungeon. So I'll comment too. Um, I think one of the easiest ways to modernize this building is actually to get rid of the Brie Soleil. I think it kind of blocks the openness um, and the windows that kind of, that make buildings a little bit more friendly and open and approachable. Um, agree with knocking the ceiling down as well. Um, but yeah, pretty, I just think the, the breeze silly, I think really ages the building in a way that's really inconsistent with the rest of the architecture that's located on the campus. Taylor, I have thought about that for years. I'm almost wondering if there was someone out there gifted at drafting and sort of photo editing, if we could see what Clark would look like without the Brie Soleil. I've long wondered what that would be uh, and how much- There's a photo be. in the presentation um, of it before the Brie Soleil was right. up. And I think- the construction photo. Better. I'd like to see it with the glass installed, you know, like lit up at night, right? What would it look like without the Brie Soleil? I actually think that if you took the Brie Soleil out and then basically reused the old lighting, I think it would modernize it and also make it look really, really cool at night. And I also, I'm just putting my two cents in that the chandelier should be kept because I will, I, I, I love the hill that I'm on with these chandeliers. Um, they are beautiful and perfect and they should be kept. Maybe they should be the, the design motif of the new Clark, uh, just you know, base everything off the chandeliers. <laughs> I think if we yes. got rid of the Brie Soleil, we would have to really work on irrigating those moats. Without the Brie Soleil, those afternoon classes would be very hot and very sunny. Um, and so if that was to take place, the moats only need irrigation. They, they're, you know, the one on Clark A East proves that they can foster a diverse uh, group of plants, even on that west side that gets intense sunlight. So the Brie Soleil goes, I, I vote for trees to take its place to cut down on some of that light. Sean, that's a really good point. The Brie Soleil does work. Um, it may be the pattern of the Brie Soleil that's the problem. Uh, if you've noticed, the new design aesthetic on campus 
actually continues to use brie soleils. Um, they're used in various canopies. Um, there's vertical columns of them. They're still very much part of campus, but they're generally done with extruded aluminum, um, metal elements of various kinds, sort of louvers more than the breeze block we see on Clark. So maybe the option is actually to use that sort of motif, that modern brie soleil that we see on the newer buildings on campus rather than the breeze block that's on it right now. Um, let's see, um, uh, Dr. Payne um, adds that she agrees with Dr. Little on Margaret Sanger. She's also wondering what elements of the building students see as best reflecting its history of, and style. That is to say, um, what elements might be preserved, repeated, honored in the new design of Clark, the redesign? And I think that's a really important question. Right? What elements of this building should appear in remodeling, what, however that remodeling takes place? So I, I think that a really important element are the benches, as I was discussing. I think that um, they really reflect this idea of a space that has like yeah. flow and openness and modernity, but also a place that's um, where you can stop and have a chat. And I just think that in a more utilitarian perspective, they're just so useful for everything that students want to do. There's benches everywhere outside of a classroom in a hallway. Um, there's just so many places for students to gather that I would hope they keep them. And honestly, I wonder if they don't keep those benches. Um, I feel like a lot of, for example, like in the C-Wing, um, there wouldn't really be that, that much seating space if you got rid of them. My personal two favorite elements of Clark are the raised pedestals and the columns. There's something about walking upstairs to enter a building that kind of fills you with pride and excitement, which is one of the reasons I would say for that to begin with. And um, I just think as a, a classicist myself, columns are just beautiful and I love the modern twist on them. And if this building does house departments like the history department, um, I think it's a cool reflection of the liberal arts as well and just the, his, the, the beautiful historical background of this kind of architecture. For me, I would have to go to bat for the Brie Soleil because I think it's a character defining feature and it's really interesting. Um, my other concern is with like the plan to demolish the B-Wing is just like having two separate things, like two separate buildings that aren't really connected. And so that, that would be my concern uh, with that. One thing that I absolutely love is when you first walk into Clark A-Wing and you see the bronze tile on the sandstone, you walk into that part of the, the building with the natural lighting and it's beautiful with the windows and everything that goes along with Clark A-Wing. That first floor is just beautiful. All right, um, I think we've gotten some good answers for there. Um, I have a question here from Zoe. What techniques would be used to protect ash trees uh, from emerald ash borer and what species would you recommend to take their place should they need to be removed? I think that's a question for you, Sean McCollum. Do you have any ideas? I think so. Um, so when I spoke with uh, CSU's landscape architect, Fred Habricht, I asked about the ash trees because there, besides the, there's a Colorado blue spruce on the corner of the Montfort quad. That and the ash trees are the only remaining original plant life from Clark's construction. So I asked what, you know, their age and that was indeterminate. You know, they were seedlings when they were planted in the sixties. So, you know, they're, they're coming up on 60 years. So they're about as big as they're gonna get. And he says that they can treat them for, from the emerald ash borer but the trees have to be over 13 centimeters in, di in, in circumference or, or it would poison them. He gave me a lot more information than, than I could understand because I'm not a horticulturalist, but these trees are big enough that they can be treated and preserved. So CSU facilities is aware of that and, and are taking efforts, which I'm happy to hear about. You'll notice on the east side of, of the Clark building uh, where all the bike racks are, that there were at one point two stands of ash trees, only one from the easternmost stand uh, remains. So there are climatic issues, snow, freezes, uh, ice. There are a lot of different options you know, to knock these trees down, but so far so good. And so as long as facilities is taking seriously the threat of the Emerald Board, they should be okay. Uh, in the event that they had to go anywhere, 
I, I think that there's a theme of planting crab apple trees, either the radiant crab apple trees, which are pink in the front of uh, Clark A North, or the spring snow crab apples like you see in the courtyard there in Clark B, which is really bright white, vibrant. Both are pollinators, both are good in the shade, and both are native uh, enough that they would probably work to shade that space. They're not as tall as the ash trees, uh, but I think they would do a good job keeping that corridor nice and bright. They also don't drop fruit, which I think is important and one of the reasons why you see them more and more on campus. Um, I can certainly look into what, what they're treating for, um, but I'm really unsure of how that process works, but I'm happy to know that they're being treated. And uh, I hope that that lends itself to renovations. If they are gonna knock down those B-wing bridges, those trees are in a kind of a, a tight spot. So I'd like to see protection, protective measures taken uh, on that end. And Sean, this isn't unprecedented in the history of this campus. Obviously, uh, this university went to great efforts to protect our elm trees um, around the oval from Dutch elm disease. And after all, we are an ag school. We should be able to figure this out some way or another. Um, yes. So, yeah, because the emerald ash borer has significantly changed the eastern forests. So uh, it's a big issue. It has, and when it arrived in Colorado, fortunately for us at CSU, we do have that, you know, our, our bones are all based in agriculture and the kind of agriculture that CSU started with was trees. We needed windbreaks and fruit orchards. So trees are one of the first things that CSU was teaching people how to do. So I'm confident that, that CSU is gonna, you know, take the right steps to protect what we have because it would be a shame to lose those big ash, you know, big ash trees. Uh, they take up so much of that space between the library and Eddie Hall. And you know that pedestrian core is one of the heaviest foot traffic corridors on campus. And so it's important to have that shade. All right, thank you. Um, um, Dr. Little also brought up that, well, I see, she, she mentions that the presentation uh, has almost totally changed her mind about Clark, um, but she still thinks the interior needs reimagining to make it relevant to educational purposes. And I think that's a really good point. It's something we really didn't necessarily talk about. And I've often thought if we had one more student in the class, that might be sort of their material world, is the material world of pedagogy um, in Clark. And I can tell you as much as I sort of like lecturing in the uh, large lecture halls in the A-Wing, when I'm in Eddie 100, you could, that's a flipped classroom with all the different screens and everything else, I can do so much more in a space like that. Um, those classrooms are so much more engaging than what we have uh, here in Clark. So I think that's, that's an important point. Um, and I'm curious among the students, is there something you would like to see uh, in the classrooms of a reimagined Clark that don't that doesn't exist here now? For me, it's windows. I think, um, especially as graduate students with most of our classes being at night, it's really depressing to walk into a class at 3 p.m. and then walk out at 6 p.m. in the winter and it's dark and you have no sense of time and no sense of like light. Um, and it can be really daunting, especially with like the stressors of being a graduate student and the sort of, you know, um, mental health aspects that go with the experience of sunshine. Um, the, especially right now with how isolating COVID-19 is making us feel in these classrooms where we're sitting six feet apart, where we're, you know, pretty spread out. Um, I think that windows itself sort of lend, uh, windows sort of lend themselves to just a more open and welcoming space, which I think I think about like us in, when we break for class and sitting in those kind of dungy hallways and just how more vibrant and more, I guess, like stimulating it would feel if we were like able to stand near a window, near the sunshine um, and appreciate the sunset or something, you know, all together at like six o'clock in the evening, um, which is just an experience that you really don't get now. And I think it makes the building feel kind of institutional in a way that's not really welcoming. I think to add on to your point, Taylor, as well about um, improving the, the the mood and general feel of um, the inside of really any building would be the addition of plants. So I'm sure uh, Sean McCollum has some ideas of the um, interior landscaping um, for plants that the you know could really change the way um, people feel in in a building like this. I agree that there's a there's a palliative quality that plants have, and it's it's sort of a tradition in Western spaces that there's a an effort made to invigorate your your whatever your home space is your school space. 
but I think part of the style of that new formalism is that it's clean. So I wonder how well we could incorporate, you know, I think of Clark A in particular with the big Florida ceiling windows, maybe instead of having plants inside, we take efforts to put something better in those moats. The Clark A West moat has nothing but an electricity box in it. And that electricity box is, is covered in stickers. That's not doing much for the, for the, uh, the shade inside, you know, the Brie Soleil's for that, but I don't know how it would work indoors. I would much rather see the moats filled in with, you know, juniper bushes or anything that's going to work with, you know, the environment and facilities would be able to manage that. But I think that would be a more effective way to get some of that greenery indoors, at least, at least for the A side anyways. And I think, Sean, that there, there's a precedent for what you're saying, even, even more engaging. Uh, the Richardson Design Center, the studios in there actually have large doors that can open up and engage right with the landscape if the weather is right, right? Similar things could be done, particularly in the A-Wing. Yeah, so the, the A-Wing west of, uh, you know, the west side of A-Wing, where that intersection between the pedestrian core and the mountain or the University Avenue view corridor meet, that's one of the heaviest, you know, most heavily trafficked parts of campus. And if any time of year when, when we're not all separated, you see students lined up along that bench wall there at that moat. So inside, it gives a nice sweeping view of the outdoors. It gives, you know, there are all these Buckeye trees out in front of the library and there are these, uh, the locust trees a little bit further on. So you can see this plant life, um, but I think that moat space being filled with plants would, would invigorate both that outside gathering space uh, and the inside because those long benches uh, that Nolan was discussing would be a lot nicer if they had some verdure, I think, behind them. I mean, I think another way to in invigorate the space when thinking about plants is a rooftop garden with the Clark Building because it has, it has a large roof and it gets so much sunlight that I would imagine that it would actually be pretty easy to at least like have a rooftop garden up there that maybe like somewhat let maybe like other students in like a science and stuff work on because that would be a really interesting way to integrate them into liberal arts and such so that we all kind of get to know each other a little bit more from different disciplines or even just using solar solar panels and plants that would be cool too I think there's a lot of yeah yeah as ta as Taylor just said um or guarded on the B-Wing breezeway. Like there's there's a lot of opportunities for rooftop gardens in Clark. I will grow vegetables on the roof of Clark if someone can get this message out there to the appropriate people. I think I think what I'm hearing here, and I, I do think this is a legitimate criticism of Clark, Clark's kind of dead, right? It, the, the, it doesn't work well for human beings. The um, it has, as you said, some of those moats aren't even irrigated. Some of them, you, you know, we had the sculpture works in the one because it can't even hold water anymore. Um, and that it just needs some life brought into it again. Um, so I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, there is, um, if, you, if you've been following the chat, there's been an interesting conversation about the uh, basement. I think they mean particularly the basement of the Sea Wing, why it's weird, um, its connection to the psych de uh, department. Uh, so if you want to dig into that, it's very interesting. I've heard those same rumors that part of the weirdness of Clark C has to do with um, experiments that are going on down in there. I don't know. I mean, there's weird experiments going on in here in the history department too. So uh, who knows? It's what we do here in the liberal arts. Um, let's Dr. see. Dr. Thomas? Yeah, go I've ahead. Got one more, I've got one more thing that I think that we could improve Clark with All right. when they read it. Um, you walk into the animal sciences building and there, there, it is very much themed toward, towards the animal sciences. I think that even just small steps towards theming the renovation towards liberal arts, however that looks like if that's a department hallway of history and archaeology and all that, I think that could go a long way towards improving the image of the liberal arts college rather than because most people think of liberal arts, they think of Clark and they think of the concrete block walls of Clark C. So I definitely think that is that is something that is already in the visioning stages is how can the new Clark be representative of the College of Liberal Arts. And I think we're also proud of CLA and our association with it, uh, that we want to broadcast it around campus as the other colleges have done so well. 
Um, so, um, all right. Well, it is now uh, just about 8.30. That's 90 minutes. Um, thanks, guys, for the excellent participation. Um, thanks, you for, all of you, for joining us. Um, I think at the highlight, high point of participation here, we had about 48 people uh, on this call, uh, which was really impressive to see. Great jobs uh, of student researchers. Uh, I really think this was a powerful way of, how, of understanding how material cu culture analysis really assists in the production of history and understanding how we reach a point like loving or hating Clark. Uh, so everyone take care, stay healthy out there. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, hopefully we can do something like this in the future. Take care. We'll see you.